I am Laura Flanders, host of The Laura Flanders Show, formerly Grit TV, which is a syndicated weekly television and radio program that seeks to give meaningful attention to the people we call the world's most important marginalized experts. Those are forward-thinking people from the worlds of business, arts, and politics, people on the cutting edge of society with reality-based strategies for realizing radical change. The man we're talking about today would probably have called a lot of people on the Laura Flanders show organic intellectuals. We call them the real majority, and they're almost never on TV. This conversation that you're a part of is part of a series where we look at classic texts. Volume okay for everyone? All right. We look at classic texts. We've looked at Rosa Lux we've looked at Tom Paine's Common Sense, Marx's Capital, and Rosa Luxemburg's reform or revolution. I serve as host and interlocutor, and then I'm usually asked to kick off um, with a little introduction, making sure you all know where you are and that you're in the right room. Why, you might be wondering, with so many classic texts to choose from, why the prison notebooks of Antonio Gramsci? Why, in the early 21st century, this one, study an early 20th century white man okay, a Sardinian of Albanian descent, who died 80 years ago this spring. Why a straight, short, five inches Italian who suffered from a spinal illness that stunted his growth? Why Antonio Gramsci? He helped to found the Communist Party in his country of Italy, but he never took state power, he never commanded an army. He spent the last 11 years of his life locked up in a fascist prison. Maybe, in fact, it's what he had to say about fascism. He lived under it and saw it rise under Mussolini. Maybe it's the thoughts he had about intellectual work. We're all intellectuals, he said. It's society who determines who gets to act, to function as an intellectual, and who does not. Or education. We're all capable, he said, of governing. Or should be, educa or should be educated to be so capable. Maybe it's what he had to say about the nation. He lived in Italy, which had just become one, sort of. Um, hadn't really developed a national cultural identity, a national popular, as he put it. Or maybe it's his thoughts on the industrial working class, which was just emerging in places like Turin in the, in the pre-war and First World War years when he was living there. It could be all of those things, but on all of those things, I would also say humbly that Gramsci was a man of his era, his early industrial, not very intersectional, verging toward the prudish, if I might be so bold on occasion, writings, including writings about the Italian peasant who likes to come home from a hard day's work and find his woman sure and unfailing, quote unquote. He didn't write so much about the women workers and breadline waiters who in wartime Turin formed the radical backbone of the labor uprisings in 1917 and 1918. In fact, he wrote at the beginning of a lot of things that many of us believe we're living through the ending of. Industrial capitalism, financial capitalism, <laughs> bourgeois liberalism, state socialism, even perhaps the nation state. Do we have time to go and go back to all these old texts and times? Well, we all believe that we do. These are, as Gramsci described them, days in which the old is dying but entrenched. On the left as well as the right, the old order dominates, as he put it, but does not lead. The crisis, he wrote, exists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born in this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear, quote unquote. I think we're all pretty familiar with a whole lot of morbid symptoms. Consumerism, Puritanism, religious extremism, and Caesars. Caesarism, a situation in which the forces of conflict balance each other catastrophically, as Gramsci put it. When they fail to serve, and a great personality arises, promising to break the logjam, but not necessarily doing anything of the kind. Sound familiar? Apart from the great part? 
Um, maybe all of that is why Gramsci. Gramsci, without forgetting, because he wouldn't want us to forget, that praxis informs philosophy and politics, and not forgetting that it was the women in the street in Turin in 1917 who, as one of them reported, quote, stopped work and gathered outside the factory gate shouting, we want bread. The boss was very worried and addressed the workers with words of milk and honey. I'll telephone military authorities straight away and order you a lorry full, or in, your, in, the, in this country, a truck full of bread. The workers, the workers, this worker writes, the workers fell silent for a while, and then all together they cried, we couldn't give a damn about the bread. We want peace, down with the profiteers, down with the war. I'll end by saying up with organic intellectuals, like the thinkers and doers on the Laura Flanders show and here today, down with prisons, up with the leadership of incarcerated intellectuals, and on at last to our panel. Kate Crean is Professor Emerita at the College of Staten Island and the Grad Center of CUNY. She's the author of, Com of Gramsci's Common Sense. Rick Wolf is the host of the nationally syndicated weekly radio program Economic Update and co-founder of democracyatwork.info. Chris Hedges is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author, also columnist for Truth Dig and host of On Contact. I'll preside, as I said, as kind of interlocutor and introducer. Each speaker is going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, followed by a moderated discussion of about half an hour. And then we'll have a question and answer period. And we will run until as close as we can to 7 o'clock, at which point we will all rush like mad to the opening plenary. All right? Thank you so much. First up, Chris Hedges. Welcome. Just a pitch for organic intellectuals. Uh, I teach in a prison in New Jersey, have for almost a decade now. Uh, I helped uh, my students, 28 of them, write a play that will be performed next spring at the theater in Trenton. It's called Caged, um, and it's up on Kickstarter. We've got to raise $30,000. So even if you can't send any money, make sure you pass it out. Um, we've got about 25000 to go. Thanks. Antonio Gramsci wrote his prison notebooks at a time not dissimilar to our own. The political parties led by the liberal class because they had detached themselves from the working class were weak or irrelevant. The radical left had been neutered and had failed to articulate a coherent alternative vision to capitalism. There was, he said, a crisis of authority. Fascism was ascendant and state repression was becoming steadily more severe and totalitarian. Benito Mussolini's regime claimed, like our corporate state, to be implementing a government based on efficiency, meritocracy, the management of society by experts and specialists, and the elimination of class conflict through mediation. It too celebrated heroic military values, that's in quotes, traditionalism, and a mythical past in the case of fascist Italy that stretched back to ancient Rome. It also rewarded conformism and loyalty, denigrated the humanities and culture in favor of vocational and technical training, spectacle, and patriotic keech. It preached a relentless positivism, ridiculed the concept of the public good by trumpeting a hyper-individualism and defang the press. Dissent and criticism were condemned as treason. And when Gramsci was arrested in 1926 and imprisoned, he technically had parliamentary immunity, but by then the rule of law was meaningless. From this bleak political landscape, we get the dictum you have all heard from Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Gramsci, like Trotsky, was an intellectual, but also a journalist and an organizer. And it was Trotsky who lamented that by the time Gramsci set out to build the Italian Communist Party, the business elites allied with the fascists had put into place such draconian forms of repression that effective 
organizing was all but impossible. Gramsci, a bit like Luxembourg, deviated from the Marxist belief that the inherent contradictions of capitalism would of themselves usher in socialism. He was opposed to the iron control of the party by a Leninist revolutionary vanguard. Revolution, he wrote, would only be achieved when the masses had gained enough consciousness to exert personal autonomy and see through the mores, stereotypes, and narratives disseminated by the dominant culture. Revolutionary change required the intellectual ability to interpret and understand reality. Hegemony for Gramsci refers to how ruling elites through mass culture manipulate our understanding of reality to promote their interests. The passive consumers of mass culture see the world not as it is, but as it is interpreted for them. Mass culture, including the press and systems of entertainment, demonize all those the ruling elite scapegoat or fear, in our own case, people of color, the poor, Muslims, undocumented workers, anti-capitalists, labor unions, intellectuals, liberals, and dissidents. The corporate elites use mass culture to transform legitimate economic and social grievances into psychological and emotional problems. Hence the drumbeat throughout our consumer society to believe in ourselves, to work hard, to be obedient, to heed the dictates of positive psychology and self-help gurus, to get an education, to focus on excellence and believe in our dreams. This mantra, which in essence assures us that reality is never an impediment to what we desire, is accompanied by the fostering of a false camaraderie with a so-called corporate family, if we work for a corporation, or a hyper-nationalism. Gramsci understood that the capitalist manager was not only tasked with maximizing profit and reducing labor costs. The manager also built mechanisms of indoctrination to ensure social integration and communal solidarity in service to capitalism, hence the constant gathering of employees at meetings to instill groupthink. Along with indoctrination, comes many security and surveillance states in our workplaces where every movement and every word is taped or filmed in the name of customer service. Corporations function as tiny totalitarian states, models for the larger corporate state. Gramsci understood that mass culture is the primary tool for submission. The more mass culture infects the thinking and attitudes of the population, the less the state has to use harsher forms of coercion for domination. Gramsci described mass culture or civil society as the trenches and permanent fortifications that defend the core interests of the elites. Revolutionary change will occur only after a prolonged series of attacks, what Gramsci calls a war of position, on these ideological defenses. It was, in his, his eyes, a type of siege warfare that requires patience, and inventiveness. Once the ruling ideology loses credibility, its institutional structures collapse. A counter-hegemony, in short, comes before power. Every revolution, he wrote, has been preceded by an intense labor of criticism, by the diffusion of culture, and the spread of ideas. The same phenomena is being repeated today in the case of socialism. It was through a critique of capitalist civilization that the unified consciousness of the proletariat was and is still being formed. And a critique implies culture, not simply a spontaneous and naturalistic evolution. To know oneself means to be oneself, to be master of oneself. And we cannot be successful in this, in this unless we also know others, their history, the successful efforts they have made to be what they are, to create the civilization they have created, and which we seek to replace with our own. Revolutions then were first and foremost a battle of ideas. Noam Chomsky boils this down to a simple dictum, tell the truth. And as Gramsci seconded, to tell the truth is revolutionary. Neoliberalism is 
neoliberalism peddles through the organs of mass communication, including mass culture, the absurd idea that the living standards of the global working class will rise by deforming societies to slavishly serve the dictates of the marketplace. We have reached a period in human history when this reigning ideology has been exposed as a lie. The abolishment of national residency requirements for corporations has been used to legalize corporate tax boycotts. The middle class, the bedrock of any capitalist democracy, is withering away and has been replaced by an angry, disenfranchised working poor. Workers are forced into two or three jobs and 70-hour work weeks to stay solvent. Medical bills, student loans, subprime mortgages, and credit card debt trigger crippling bankruptcies. The corporate managerial class, meanwhile, collects billions in compensation and uses its money and its lobbyists to destroy democratic institutions. It has cemented into place a system the political philosopher Sheldon Wolin calls inverted totalitarianism. As these lies become transparent, we are thrown into what Gramsci calls an interregnum, a time when the reigning ideology has lost credibility but has yet to be replaced by a new one. This crisis consists, Gramsci wrote, precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born, and in this interregnum a great variety of morbid symptoms appear, hence political mutations such as Donald Trump or in Gramsci's time Mussolini. The acceleration of deindustrialization by the 1970s created a crisis that forced the ruling elites to create a new political paradigm. As Stuart Hall explains in his book, Policing the Crisis, the politics of resentment, trumpeted by a corporate media, shifted its focus from the common good to race, crime, and law and order. It told those undergoing profound economic and political change that their suffering stemmed not from corporate greed, but from a threat to national integrity. The old consensus that buttressed the programs of the New Deal and the welfare state was attacked as enabling criminal black youth, welfare queens, and social parasites. The parasites were to blame. This opened the door to an authoritarian populism begun by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, which supposedly championed family values, traditional morality, individual autonomy, law and order, the Christian faith, and a return to a mythical past, at least for white Americans. Mass culture is a potent and dangerous counter-revolutionary force. It creates a herd mentality. It banishes independent and autonomous thought. It destroys our self-confidence. It marginalizes and discredits nonconformists. It depoliticizes the citizenry. It fosters a sense of collective futility and impotence by presenting the ruling ideology as a revealed, unassailable truth, an inevitable and an inexorable force that alone makes human progress possible. Mass culture is designed to foster what Gramsci called a confused and fragmentary consciousness, or what Marx called false consciousness, the belief by the proletariat that its true interests are aligned with those of the ruling class, in our case, global corporatism. We are not a product of nature, however, Gramsci wrote, but a product of our history and our culture. If we do not know our history and our culture, rather than the one manufactured for us, we cannot surmount the forces of oppression. And this is why the movements of the 1960s terrified the elites. These movements not only gave people an understanding of their power, but they exposed the lies and ideological manipulation of the ruling classes. And that is why the corporatists invested billions to fight back. If we do not know our history, we have no point of comparison and no knowledge of the continuity of capitalist oppression. Once democracy fails, as Plato warned, it always creates the conditions for tyranny based on popular support. And that is what happened in Italy, in fascist Italy, and what has happened with the election of Trump. The goal in a collapsed democracy is not, Gramsci wrote, as Gramsci said, to rouse the civic consciousness of the nation, but to nurture and recreate a civic consciousness that has been lost. 
Democracy throughout most of the history of the West was an anomaly after the collapse of the Athenian democracy in 322, and this democracy was only for men and excluded slaves. It was 2,000 years before another democratic government came into existence. It has only been in the latter part of the 20th century that democratic governments, now under assault from proto-fascist movements, were able to flourish, however imperfectly, our own system of government, if one takes into consideration the exclusion of African Americans, Native Americans, men without property, and women, could not be defined as a full democracy until the middle of the last century. And we are now rolling back towards the more familiar despotism. There is a reason the capitalist state seeks to keep workers unconscious. No worker will ever receive the full benefit of his or her work under capitalism, since this would destroy capitalism itself. Any worker who truly grasped his or her interests would be dedicated to the overthrow of the capitalist order. Gramsci edited the paper in Turin, The New Order, during the labor uprisings in 1919, and as Laura said, 1917, that saw workers take over factory floors and form a workers' councils. He and the other writers on the paper who inexplicably ceased publication at the height of the unrest to devote themselves to organizing, did not advocate positions until they had canvassed and spoken at length to the workers' councils. These councils, Gramsci wrote, not only gave workers power over their work lives, but broke down the wall, barricading the private citizen from participation in political life. Revolutionary policy for Gramsci did not come from above, but from below. It was organic. And the failure in his eyes of revolutionary elites is that they were often prone to be just as dictatorial and as disconnected as capitalist elites. The masses had to be integrated into the structures of power to create a new form of mass politics. Hence, his insistence that all people are intellectuals capable of autonomous and independent thought. A democracy is only possible when all citizens understand and have a say in the exercise of power. Gramsci would have despaired of the divide in the United States between our anemic left and the working class, the ridiculing of Trump's supporters, the failure to listen to and heed the legitimate suffering of the working poor, including the white working poor, ensures that any revolt will be stillborn. Those of us who seek to overthrow the corporate state will have to begin locally. This means advocating issues such as raising the minimum wage, fighting for clean water, universal health care, and good public education, including free university education, that speak directly to improving the lives of the working class. It does not mean lecturing the working class, and especially the white working class, about multiculturalism and identity politics. Revolt, however, without an alternative vision Gramsci knew was doomed. Workers are as easily mobilized around anti-democratic ideologies such as fascism or racism. If they lack consciousness, consciousness, they can become a dark force in the body politic as any Trump rally, uh, as in any Trump rally. The insistence on a vision of a new order set Gramsci against the anarchists and labor unions. The state could deal with unrest, even revolt, he knew, as long as it was sporadic and localized and not tied to a plan to replace the structures that keep the ruling elites in power. The socialist state cannot be embodied in the institutions of the capitalist state, he wrote. The socialist state must be a fundamentally new creation. The institutions of the capitalist state are organized in such a way as to facilitate free competition, merely to change the personnel in such a way merely to change the personnel in these institutions is hardly going to change the direction of their activity. Okay, one second. I'll give my last few paragraphs. <coughs> Gramsci's understanding of how ruling elites manufacture consent separated Gramsci from Marx. Marx saw critical theory as preliminary to the construction of an egalitarian and just society. In the just society, critical theory like the state, however, would wither away. Gramsci, like Nietzsche, knew that the elites would continually reproduce conditions and ideologies to retake control. 
This demanded the constant vigilance of the critical revolutionary theorist. There would be a never-ending battle of ideas, those spun out by the elites to justify their privileges and the radical theorists who would expose the ideas as tools of repression. The working class would be under constant assault from cultural and ideological forces determined to undermine it. For Gramsci, human agency was therefore essential. History is made, he said, by human will. It is not predetermined. How we gain consciousness and how we achieve revolution cannot be understood by solely examining the means of production. We cannot, he continued, predict the course of history. We can go backwards as well as forwards. We must therefore use our human agency to create a vibrant counterculture that ultimately makes revolution possible. And this makes Gramsci, as we too recoil from the onslaught of corporate fascism, our contemporary. Thank you. Okay, so the, um, the, the, the message we want conveyed is that there is overflow room. It's L282. The number is up there, L282. It's not working. That's not helpful. All right, so may I suggest that we look around. Is there somebody less, less um, uh, you know, strong and, and, well, and active as you? There you? If there's an empty chair or if there is somebody you would be embarrassed to stand while you are sitting, get up. Give them your chair. Give them your seat. Come on, you're going to be embarrassed when you look at this crowd and say, I should have given up my seat. And we will do our best to get L282 functioning. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure if, you get, if you're standing and you get tired and you tap the shoulder of somebody who is sitting in a little while, they'll be happy to switch with you, right? Right? Yeah. I, I knew that we have that collective feeling in here. Is it working now? I want to suggest people get comfortable. Let's keep going. Because otherwise we're going to be out of time. Yeah? Um, I think Kate was going to go next. Is that right? No, you want Rick to go next? Yes. Okay. Rick Wolf. I will be briefer than... Can you all hear me? All right. I will be briefer than Chris because he's done some of the work I would have taken time uh, to do. Uh, but I want to do a bit more in the way of celebrating Mr. Gramsci for what he offers us now and why it is so important to provoke you or to induce you to do some reading. The reading is heavy. The prison notebooks carry go over several volumes. A few years ago, the U Columbia University Press made the decision to print the prison notebooks of Mr. Gramsci. But in a way, those prison notebooks illustrate the dictum of Mao, that it's important to remember that everything is contradictory and that therefore bad things, if you figure out the contradiction, can be turned into good ones. Mussolini arrested Mr. Gramsci and basically killed him slowly in jail. When they finally let him out, he died within a few months. He had been denied medical care and all, all the usual ways of that kind of behavior. But he had many years in jail and was able to write, and he made a contribution. Before I get to that, one of the things that always drew me to Mr. Gramsci's work was the fact that he was deliberate, as Marx was himself, 
in being what most people would call a scholar, but also always being an activist. This is difficult here in the United States, often to understand. I could tell you absurd numbers of stories of either participating or being part of a seminar in an English department at prestigious American universities where the professor and the students were discussing Gramsci's marvelous theories of the subaltern or theories of the complex role played by the Roman Catholic Church in Italy, something he studied at great length. Realizing that as I listened, these people were talking as though this were another great thinker. When I raised my hand, which I began to enjoy after a while doing, and reminded everyone, yes, he's a great thinker, but I want you to all remember, of course, that he was a Marxist. <laughs> and people would look at me as if I had sud suddenly told an off-color joke in the wrong moment. <laughs> and when the trouble subsided, I waited a few more minutes. I told you I enjoyed this. And then I said, you know what else? He was the leader of the Italian Communist Party for a long time. Like most of his adult life, try that one. When that didn't subside after a while, I then went on. He called those collections of workers that Chris mentioned, the workers' councils in Torino, where the workers were on strike against the company you may have heard of, Fiat. He called them workers' council because that was a translation into Italian of the Russian word Soviet. He was an admirer of Mr. Lenin, a copier of Mr. Lenin. He was also on occasion a critic, which would be logical the things to go together, but not either or. He was a communist and the head of the Italian Communist Party. And under his leadership, that party became what it was for most of the post-World War II period, <laughs> the largest communist party outside the Soviet Union, whose imprint on Italian politics is still clear, even though the party itself is barely there. The man was a committed scholar and activist all his life. The scholarly part is in the prison notebooks, but so is the activism. And I think it's relevant that we picked it for this left forum because the goals of the left forum as an institution are to bring together scholars and activists. Not only that they talk to each other and cross-fertilize one another, but maybe even follow Gramsci's example and become one another. And why? Why was Gramsci so interested in activists also being students, scholars, studiers of what had gone before? And here I want to amplify something Chris also touched on. Gramsci was distraught that that general strike in Torino, built out of the fiat strike, didn't succeed. He was in a way envious of Lenin and Trotsky and the others because it did succeed there. Why didn't it succeed in Italy when the conditions seemed so parallel, when the revolution broke out? And his answer was, to be overly simple, that the objective conditions, if you like, the poverty, the oppression in the factory, the difficulties of the lives of the majority of working people and of Italy's large agrarian working class. They were at a revolutionary point. But what wasn't revolutionary was what was in the culture, what was in the mind. And it became clear to Gramsci that the left, the communists, the Marxists, the revolutionaries, had under, un, undervalued the study of culture and of how a culture can shape the mentality of a working class so that even when everything else is in place, 
to make the change, the cultural condition, the mentality of the working class isn't there. And he asked the important question, why not? How did that come to be that way? How was the capitalist class saved when it had made such a mess of its own economic system that it was ready to pop? but without half understanding it, had done enough to the mentality of the mass of people that they couldn't or wouldn't see their way clear to move when the opportunity arose. What happened? Why? And here's his answer, and that's all I really have to offer, because it strikes me that his answer is as urgently relevant to his time as it is to ours. He begins with recognizing a problem. The capitalists, the people with a lot of money who run the business of a society in modern life, are a tiny number, which means immediately they have a big problem. They're a tiny number. And the people they oppress and they underpay are a large number. This is a very troubling reality. You must do something. Whether you're understanding it or not really doesn't matter. You have to do something to handle the imbalance. Slave masters figured that out relative to slaves. Feudal lords figured it out relative to serfs. And capitalists have figured it out, says Gramsci, in relationship to the working class. And the basic idea, as he looks at it, he studies Italy particularly because that's where he's from. And he comes out of an incredibly creative Italian intellectual left wing that he borrowed from and that he honored with his work. His answer was, and here I may disagree a little bit with others, his answer was there is no such thing as false consciousness. There are only different consciousnesses. The working class, to use a modern American language, does not suffer from false consciousness, should not be asked the question, why do you vote against your own interests? Because the answer Gramsci would immediately insist on is, they don't. What then are they doing? They have been carefully cultivated to have and to feel deeply about other interests. And that's a long, difficult process. How do you get the working class to be not interested so much in what happens at the workplace, not interested so much what happens in the voting booth, but terribly interested in foreign military adventures, terribly interested in rituals of patriotism and nationalism? That takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of time to cultivate to put it as sharply as I can imagine. Suppose a working class, obviously I'm not talking about the United States, but just suppose a working class is screwed on the job, underpaid, overworked, all of that. Its interest in that job situation could be to revolutionize it, to transform it. That's what we want. But someone else might construct the same experience as, that's not the important part of you. That's not really what you're about. Are you screwed as a consumer? Well, that's not really an important part either. You know what's really important about you? Is you're white. Or you're an American. Or you're not an immigrant. These are the important things about you, which are going to be celebrated, are going to be raised up and honored. You have an interest in supporting that honoring and engaging that because it honors you in a society where you as a worker are dishonored all the time. That's why you don't want to stay on that job, do you? and why you go on the way from the job home and stop at that famous place that offers you what you haven't had all day, namely, a happy hour.
right? So you don't. You look for something else. But you begin to be having an interest in the patriotism, in the nationalism, in the white business. Your skin color becomes important. Your origin or that of your family. People have an interest. And the struggle becomes in Gramsci's mind. How do we honor and recognize the interests served by the identifications that have been built into this culture that militate against revolution and change? And how do we build a, to use his language, counter hegemonic, a way of developing beliefs and feelings that will make people have an interest in changing their conditions? rather than celebrating nationalism. Final thought. I don't know how many of you read the speech by our president after he withdrew the United States from the Paris Accords yesterday. But if you read the speech, and I urge you to do it, it is an endless repetition of one idea. I, Trump, am saving America from the evil machinations of foreigners, climate lunatics, and others who threaten our American situation. It is a celebration of nationalism, a nationalism that has been the identification for people whose other parts of life have been made horrible by the very forces that celebrate the nationalism. They are teaching people how to think of themselves in such a way that militates against seeing and responding to what we are trying to do. We have to understand that, says Gramsci. We have to deal with undermining the identifications people have with the interests that they are allowed to celebrate around themselves, undermine that, and offer others the romance, because that's partly what it is, of being a fighter for justice. That's a very powerful image. It could become a powerful image for millions of Americans. So could the notion that we welcome immigrants, that to celebrate the solidarity of people, because after all, the immigrants were driven to come here by the same forces that are the problem. And that maybe the immigrants together with the workers here could become a counter. Those images have worked. They can work again. But it has to be an understood struggle over the culture of a society to identify which parts of that culture are the problems for social change, and which are the opportunities. Gramsci began as a young man as a theater critic for a newspaper in Italy. He tried to understand in his reviews what theater captured people and what didn't. That's the same issue. What theater is capturing people? Mr. Trump is a theater producer as have all the other presidents been. We have to understand how they make their theater successful and offer an alternative theater that can pull people to a place where the objective situations and the subjective come together to make the change happen. Thank you. Okay. So the, um, the overflow room is apparently functioning for people that want to be in the overflow room rather than standing on the edges or uncomfortable. Um, anybody wants to move out there, do it now, and please close the door after you. Thank you. Kate. Thank you. Um, OK, actually, I think my uh, remarks are going to follow quite nicely uh, from Rick's, although I didn't know what he was going to say until I came here. Um, in his best-selling Capital in the 21st Century, Thomas Piketty, the explicitly non-Marxist French... Oh, dear. OK. Uh, can you hear me now? OK. Uh, OK. 
It, it doesn't, it's, uh, uh, so, okay, okay, can you, you can hear me now. In his best-selling Capital in the 21st Century, Thomas Piketty, the explicitly non-Marxist French economist, observes that, quote, the history of inequality is shaped by the way economic, social, and political actors view what is just and what is not, as well as, as, well as by the relative power of those actors and the collective choices that result, unquote. In the now celebrated prison notebooks, Gramsci wrote during his long years of incarceration by Mussolini's fascist regime, he reflects at length on the nature and causes of inequality. These reflections, I suggest, offer us a particularly fruitful way of approaching the question of how economic, social, and political actors come to their understanding of what is just and what is not. For Gramsci, co-founder of the Italian Communist Party and a thinker who is very much part of the Marxist tradition, the concept of class is central to any understanding <coughs> of inequality. The concept of class we find in the notebooks, however, is is, has little in common with the all too common caricatures of Marxist notions of class that limit class to economic inequality. Rather, this is an understanding of class that recognizes the many different forms of structural inequality can take. The major, um, the major classes in the notebooks may be rooted in, as Gramsci writes, quote, an essential function in the world of economic production, unquote. But the passage from those roots is far from straightforward. For Gramsci, class as it is lived is not confined to economic inequality. The value of the approach we find in the notebooks is that it opens up the notion of class to embrace the whole spectrum of ways in which structural inequalities reproduced over generations manifest themselves in the lives of women and men. And this is an approach that recognizes that inequalities of gender of race and ethnicity, of sexual orientation, and so on, are not separate from class, but how class is lived. Sorry. The notebooks map how, in certain times and places, lived inequality and oppression coalesce into self-aware classes that become the bases historical blocks with the power to bring about radical social transformation. To understand Gramsci's nuanced and multifaceted understanding of class, it is helpful to approach it through three interlinked concepts that are central to his thinking. Subalternity, intellectuals, and common sense. First, subalternity. Thanks in large part to the writings of the subaltern studies scholars, the term subaltern has entered the academic mainstream. In the course of its journey, however, it has lost much of the multi-layered richness it has in the notebooks. Subaltern is not, as has so often been claimed, simply a euphemism for proletariat. Rather, it is a broad, flexible category that encompasses all those who are oppressed rather than oppressing, ruled rather than ruling. As Marcus Green has noted, at different points in the notebook Gramsci devoted to subaltern social groups, slaves, peasants, religious groups, women, different races, and the proletariat are all referred to as subaltern social groups. Tellingly, 
as Gramsci scholar Joseph Buttigieg has pointed out, the notebooks never speak of the subaltern in the singular. They talk of subaltern classes or subaltern social groups. It is a mistake, Buttigieg, has pointed, um, Buttigieg stresses, to seek a precise definition of subaltern or subaltern social groups as conceived by Gramsci. He does not regard uh, them as a single, much less a homogeneous entity. It is precisely why he always refers to them in the plural, unquote. The point is that if we want to define subalternity precisely, then we need to know which subalterns, at which historical moment we are talking about, and the particular nature of their particular subalternity. The second key concept is that of intellectuals. One of Gramsci's best known, but like subaltern, often min misunderstood concept is that of the organic intellectual. Part, part of the problem is that nowhere in the notebooks can we find a neat capsule definition. To grasp what Gramsci means by organic intellectual, a good place to begin is with his rejection of most standard definitions of intellectuals. Intellectuals, he stresses, are not defined by their possession of specific skills or expertise, but by the role they play as producers or distributors of the knowledge that in a given time and place is seen as authoritative. In essence, Gramsci shifts the emphasis from individual intellectuals to the process of knowledge production. The key question for him is, how do certain understandings of reality, certain narratives as, as to how the world works, establish themselves as authoritative, as true? How, to use what is perhaps Gramsci's best known term, do certain narratives become hegemonic? And when and how are existing hegemonic narratives effectively challenged and replaced by others? The role of intellectuals, both in the creation and reproduction of such narratives and in the effective challenging of them, is one of the notebook's major topics. And at the heart of Gramsci's theorization of this role is the concept of the organic intellectual. The organicity of organic intellectuals is defined not by their personal background, but by the degree to which their knowledge they produce and distribute is rooted in the lived experience of a particular social group or class. They are organic in that they are the bearers of a particular collective lived experience, which they have transformed into coherent political narratives capable of achieving hegemony. Such potentially transformative narratives do not, however, emerge unaided from the brains of intellectuals. They are the product of dialogue between intellectuals and those living the reality intellectuals theorize. And this is where the concept of common sense, senso comune, comes in. Senso comune is the term Gramsci uses for all those heterogeneous beliefs people arrive at, not through critical reflection, but encounter as undeniable, self-evident truths. It's important here to note that the um, Italian term senso comune lacks the overwhelmingly positive connotations of the English term common sense. It's a far more neutral term. Gramsci takes common sense very seriously while never romanticizing it. Common sense's 
most fundamental characteristic, he writes, quote, is that it is a conception which even in the brain of one individual is fragmentary, incoherent, and inconsistent, uh, unquote. It is not that, quote, there are no truths in common sense. Rather, common sense is an ambiguous, contradictory, and multiform concept. To refer to common sense uh, as a confirmation of truth is a nonsense. Uh, and then again, another quote, common sense is a chaotic aggregate of disparate conceptions, and one can find there anything one likes, unquote. And very importantly, over time, this aggregate continually shifts as new elements are added and old ones discarded. Despite all his criticisms, however, Gramsci's attitude to common sense is far from wholly negative. Embedded within the chaotic confusion of common sense, he identifies what he terms buon senso, good sense. And for him, it is these strands of good sense that are, um, it is in these strands of uh, good sense that new progressive political narratives have their origin. Is it possible, he writes, quote, that a formerly new conception can present itself in a guise other than the crude, unsophisticated version of the populace. Common sense is, for Gramsci, a crucially important site where the seeds of new oppositional um, conceptions of the world are to be found. New narratives of reality capable of challenging the existing hegemony in ways that go beyond simple resistance to the conceiving of a new, more progressive hegemony. Such seeds represent the still incoherent expressions of the, um, of the world as viewed from the vantage point of a subaltern group beginning to overcome its subalternity. As it emerges from subalternity to become a distinct and self-aware class, it produces its own organic intellectuals who transform those, these seeds of common sense into coherent and elaborated narratives that provide it, as it were, with a mirror in which it sees its lived experience reflected and made intelligible. The elaborated accounts of reality produced by a class's intellectuals must then also be translated into a new, accessible, and emotionally appealing common sense. At the heart of the notion of the organic intellectual, there is, in fact, a strong epistemological claim, namely that the foundational political narratives produced by subaltern groups as they emerge from subalternity and achieve hegemony have their origin in the incohate conceptions of the world born of the day-to-day -day experience of living in a given subaltern location. Organic intellectuals elaborate this implicit philosophy into a coherent, explicit philosophy, but they do not originate it. As intellectuals, their organicity consists in, quote, having worked out and made coherent the principles and problems, unquote, that have arisen, quote, out of the practical activity, unquote, of the group that has produced these particular intellectuals. In other words, the reason why progressive intellectuals need to pay serious attention to common sense is not only because effective political narratives need to establish themselves as common sense, although that too is important, but because it is only when the philosophy of intellectuals has genuinely emerged from subaltern experience 
that it is possible for subalterns and their intellectuals to come together as a cultural and social unity. Only then can they become a historical block with the power to bring about social transformation. Gramsci's notion of common sense, I would argue, provides a useful guide for contemporary progressives. We may live in a transformed media world, but the insistence that we take everything seriously that seems simple common sense to large numbers of people is as relevant today as when the notebooks were written. Only a political narrative that explains inequality and oppression in a way that connects with subalterns emotionally as well as intellectually can hope to mobilize the kind of movement that might actually bring about significant change. Effective narratives need to describe the reality subalterns confront in an immediate and visceral way and to offer a positive alternative in which they can believe. Occupy Wall Street, with its resonant slogan, we are the 99%, provides an interesting example of just such a narrative. To the extent that Occupy was a movement, however embryonic, that challenged the prevailing capitalist hegemony, it can be seen as a recognition of profound structural inequality. As a conception of the world, the Occupy narrative may often have been incoherent and the movement itself fleeting, but the widespread recognition and acceptance of its common sense message of what is just and what is not surely suggests the existence of a social group with its own conception of the world distinct from the hegemonic capitalist narrative, even if, as uh, the conception of a still subaltern group, it is necessarily, to use Gramsci's words, quote, only embryonic, a conception which manifests itself in action, but occasionally and in flashes, unquote. Taken together, Gramsci's notion, concepts of subalternity, intellectuals, and common sense can help us trace the genesis of, of both the narratives that rationalize and those that challenge capitalist forms of inequality. We can see the three concepts as providing a map of the realities of class. In broad terms, this map charts the relationship between the condition of subalternity and the knowledge born from living that subalternity. First, as incoherent and contradictory common sense, but then elaborated and rendered coherent by the organic intellectuals who emerge out of that specific subaltern experience and then retranslated into a new common sense. Such knowledge, always organically linked to the structural realities of class, is a central element in the reproduction or transformation of any regime of power. Despite being written in the mid-20th century, Gramsci's complicated um, and anything but economistic account of class can, I would argue, provide a helpful guide, although never a simple template, for those trying to imagine the possibilities for radical change in our grossly unequal 21st century world. All right, so we, let's take about uh, 15 minutes for a little bit of conversation, and then we'll come to Q&A. So I just have a couple of questions, uh, one really for each of you. For, for, for you, Chris, one of the aspects that Gramsci writes about is the old's failure to recognize the crisis. Those entrenched powers who are old that are still entrenched and not allowing the new to be born. How conscious do you think our hegemonic old are of this period being a period of crisis? And I don't mean just of the right, but of the left. No, I think the word 
interregnum is right. I think that the, the credibility of neoliberalism and global capital ha has been shredded and the lies, as I mentioned in my talk, have been exposed. I don't think that the counterforces on the left have yet replaced that with a vision, what Gramsci would call a, a counter hegemony, that has captured the popular imagination. And until that is done, the uh, ruling elites uh, can deal with sporadic and localized Standing Rock, fracking sites, Black Lives Matter. Uh, but once these movements coalesce around a particular vision, and once that vision is something that is um, ingested within the body politic, then they're in tremendous trouble. Alexander Berkman actually wrote an essay about this. He talked about a period of revolutionary ferment as being invisible, like water boiling on a kettle when the, when the credibility of the old regime dies, and then when you don't actually see those undercurrents, which I think we're undergoing. That, as Gramsci well understood, doesn't mean that we won't be able to blunt the forces of fascism. It may be that fascism will... Uh, and, of course, the mass media uh, has, has created fertile ground. Trump, of course, is, is, is the, the symptom, not the disease. He is, he is a creation of the mass media, quite literally, in terms of the 12 years he spent on The Apprentice, where he became this fictional financial titan. And then, because of the primacy of profit over uh, news, uh, he was given lavish coverage, 23 times the coverage on CNN that Bernie Sanders. They spent more time on Trump's empty podium waiting for him to come out and speak. because And CNN last year had its highest profits ever, and, and this year is set to increase even those profits. And so there is a deep collusion uh, in this kind of burlesque, this political theater that's been created that is symptomatic of a fascist, proto-fascist, authoritarian society. So however much, uh, you know, you read uh, the New York Times magazine piece on Zucker, uh, it, he consciously models CNN off of ESPN. It's, it's, it, he says this. It's like a sports contest. And so you have Van Jones on one side, and they go out and find some Yahoo who lives in some town in Pennsylvania, literally, to, be, to defend Trump. It, but it's... It's quite frightening, and, but, and, but and so we're talking about systems. But do you think part of the rise of Trump has to do with liberals and Democrats' failure to recognize a crisis that was well, happening? Well, it has to do more, less recognize a crisis. You can watch Hillary Clinton every day of the, in, the utter obtuseness of a Democratic Party leader to recognize why she lost, which was because the Democratic Party betrayed working men and women, had nothing to do with Comey or Russia. I mean, not that those aren't elements, but that's not why she lost. And I think that it's, it's worse than that. It's the bankruptcy of the liberal class, uh, beginning in particular with the Clintons, when they continued to speak in that feel-your-pain language of liberalism while selling out working men and women on behalf of corporate interests. And um, Clinton did as much damage a as anyone, uh, w starting with NAFTA, deregulation of the FCC, destruction of welfare, 70% of the original recipients were children, uh, Glass-Steagall, the uh, explosion of our prison population, that all came out of Clinton. And uh, that, ga that game's up. It's not, it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so we are in a very tenuous and frightening position. Uh, Clump, Trump really represents the naked kleptocracy. The kleptocracy was there, but it had the patina or the facade, the democratic facade. And so it's kind of the late Roman Empire where we're getting Commodus and Nero and Caligula um, who just steal out in the open, and they steal out. In the, this is what Trump is instilled, mm -hmm. not just for his family. Of course, his family will become f even richer than it is, but look at Betsy DeVos or uh, Mnuchin or any of these figures. It's just about theft, and they, they, they can do it in the open because we're so weak. So to, to you, Rick, I'm, I'm curious about this. Um, how hegemonic is our hegemony? I mean, because every, every week on your radio program, you cover, among other things, um, alternative models of organizing, things that are happening not unlike the fiat worker takeover from time to time. You know, when it comes to this 
experimentation or praxis that, tr that Gramsci talked about, where would you say we are on the dial? Well, to answer and also to pick up on, on Chris, for me, watching the spectacle entails both the parties. This is a lovely arrangement in this country. Each party basically maintains the same system, does it while ripping off the mass of people. Over the period of four or eight years, the mass of people gets it to some degree and then goes through this absurd ritual of voting for the other party, which comes in promising to undo what was just done, then does it again, pissing everybody off, who then votes in the next alteration of these two parties. The hegemony lies in making that the nature of politics, making the debate be between these two who have the same agenda with some slight variations, which are important. But by the way, making those other I issues important is another way, and that contradiction has to be faced, of making the system question disappear. So we're going to get all excited about whether some people are burning a flag or whether what is going on in Syria is more describable this way or that way, whether the fights to pick more urgent issues are about abortion or about immigration. However you play these issues, one of the side effects is to make the underlying system, which both parties reinforce, off the agenda out of the consciousness. That's our job. We have to put that back on the front burner, and then we have to do what neither of those parties can do, which is to offer something that can attract people, that can actually be begin to be thought of as a new direction. And we have that now in the United States. It's, it's embryonic. It's weak. I find most exciting, which some of you I'm sure have picked it up by now, this notion that the cooperative, whether it be in a credit union on the most moderate scale or in a community that has its own little currency so that they can share a little bit, or whether it's in the worker co-op movement or in any of these are the beginnings, if they be recognized for what they are, of an alternative vision of how to organize an economic system so that it might be part of something politically and culturally liberating and therefore a focus, something people could begin to develop an interest in with all the cultural and political. That has to be offered. And if we do that and do it well, we'll win because the Democrats have nothing. All the Democrats are going to do is say in the next few years, we're not like that. We're not as bad as that. So and that was the campaign this last time. I'm not, sh she said she's not as bad as him. And he said he's not as bad as her. And they appealed to the people, and people chose. So let me bring Kate into this. Um, and maybe you could just give your, your microphone to Kate. Um, one of the reasons I'm so taken by those women of, and workers of Turin in 19, I think it was 17 or 18, one of those strikes, was because there they were in war time. Suddenly, the majority of those who were participating in the strike, 64%, I think, in 1917, even though there were only 25% of the working class population. But women were suddenly in a new role. They were also still having to feed their families, so they were the ones feeling, first and foremost, the food shortages. And so they were literally going from the bread lines, which were very long, to the factory floor. And then I love the way that they merge. You're going to give us bread, but that isn't all we want. My question to you is, what would Gramsci perhaps say, or maybe better, what would you say, <laughs> about how we deal with this moment where the subaltern groups that you describe are still in this country most often pitted against each other, or, or as, as Chris said, used to kind of bludgeon one another uh, without what you describe so beautifully as appreciation for the upward movement of consciousness, which is a whole different thing from pointing fingers and attacking people for what they don't know. Um, right. Well, I think one of the things that is really important uh, in Gramsci is the particular way he thinks about culture. And for him, um, and this is one, I mean, 
class is lived through these various kinds of culture. And for him, these cultures are something that are dynamic, and they are something that are brought into being. And one of the uh, tasks of a progressive political um, movement is precisely uh, this kind of cultural struggle. Right, hold, hold that thought. Don't forget where you were. Um, we've apparently been threatened with being closed down by the fire marshals because there's too many people standing. It is working in the overflow room. Please, if you're standing and you want to hear the end of Kate's sentence, we will hold. She will remember what she's about to say. <laughs> and we won't all get closed down. <laughs> sorry, everybody. And sorry, Kate. Appreciate that's, it. That's okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, L2, so the same floor, but 82, which is just a little bit further down the hallway on the left, I think. Sorry, everyone, and thank you. We'll just chat amongst ourselves. It's because of fire codes. See how responsive left forum people are to the <laughs> urgencies of the common good. Um, good? No, you're good. Just don't stand. I, I'm going to make that ruling. All right, Kate, do you remember where you were? Um, I, I think so. Um, so uh, for, for Gramsci, I mean, Gramsci says, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Gramsci says uh, at one point that one of the most important fronts in the struggle is the cultural, that we need this cultural front. And what this means, what he means by this, I think, is precisely um, what elsewhere he called um, a war of position, which is where there is this need to um, create new understandings, go back to Piketty, of what's just and what's not, and how the world works. And I think one of the most depressing things for me about the current moment is the kind of atrophy and shrinking of the kind of cultural spaces where um, these more progressive narratives and new narratives can emerge, be nurtured, and uh, distributed. And I think this is, I mean, a very obvious example is the decline of the union movement. I mean, these were, and we all know unions had their problems with kind of racism, with gender, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, they did represent, however um, imperfectly, certain kinds of spaces where uh, different ways of thinking about how the world is organized, should be organized, could be organized. And I think that this is something um, that Gramsci, uh, you know, why Gramsci is so, um, uh, put such, so much emphasis on culture in the prison notebooks is precisely thinking about how to um, escape the kind of mind-forged manacles of the existing hegemony and being able to imagine an alternative uh, reality. Um, you know, there is um, a, a wonderful quote where he says, um, even when the subaltern uh, rises, um, uh, resists, they do so anxiously. And it's that <coughs> kind of anxiousness that I think um, uh, it's so important to find these kind of powerful and persuasive narratives that do operate not merely at um, an intellectual level, but at a sort of visceral, emotional level, to, to find those and uh, to uh, spread them, I guess. There's a lot that we could all continue to say, but let's take some questions from the floor. We've got about 10 more minutes. Um, okay, I'll, I'll exercise aggressive affirmative action, as usual. Um, here, first, of the, but I'll, I'll identify some people. One, two, three, for the first three. One, 
let's um, get you a mic. Hi, um, I spent the last two weeks um, in the West Bank with the Interfaith uh, Peace Delegation. And what I saw rising from the Palestinian leaders that we met was with was an organic intellectual. And I, what I, I'm not sure if I have a question, but it's like to see the force in action and if they can remain nonviolent, it's, there's a possibility for a movement of an entire culture of people towards, towards owning what they have, that they've owed for, owned for years and years. So I don't know if people want to comment on what they see in the Palestinian action at this time. Oh, are we looking in all the right places for the good news? I'll take all three questions and then um, come back to the, audience, to the panelists. Okay, um, so my question is for all of you. So I heard, um, yeah, okay. So um, you guys mentioned a lot, uh, you talked a lot about narrative, about cultural hegemony, um, about cultural fronts. And one, one term that I didn't hear come up that I'm interested in uh, hearing you all kind of assimilate this into what you were talking about is the concept of reification. So um, I'm thinking of Marx and specifically the material condition, so not cultural conditions that render um, social reproduction, right? So I'm thinking about um, workers who are quite conscious of the fact that they're being exploited, right? Um, but who don't who don't do anything out of because of their material conditions, not ideology. So Question. that entails the uh, great risks of organizing, et cetera. So how do you assimilate that more materialist uh, reading of Gramsci and Mar Marx within your within your conceptions of social reproduction? Great question. Thank you. Who was the person over here? Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, first off, thank you so much. Uh, second off. Um, I think that before we attack uh, Trump's weaknesses, we have to go after his strengths. And he's a brilliant media manipulator. You say two words, you say Trump's tweets, and immediately you get a little laugh or a, or a giggle. However, you know, the intellectual will say, hey, this is ridiculous. But Trump is saying, I'm speaking to you. I'm talking to you, and look at these uh, intellectuals questioning why I'm even talking to you. So how do we how do we um, acknowledge that Trump is does have his strengths, and then go after his weaknesses? Thank you. So either of you want to res any of you want to respond to either of those three questions? Palestine, a front we should look at more. What about well, reification in the more economist perspective? Well, well, since I've got the mic, should I just start off and then? And um, what Trump does well. Yeah, um, I think the, the uh, Palestinians, um, I think that's, that's a very good uh, example. And that is indeed um, a kind of site where there is um, uh, an opportunity for um, a sort of a different understanding um, of the world uh, to emerge. And uh, I think um, I'm glad you raised the question of the... Um, uh, the uh, um, uh, 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 the question of material realities. Because this, I think, is very, very important. In a way, for Gramsci, Gramsci is very much a Marxist. And he takes it as read that, sort of as Marx and Engels said, the uh, how people make their living, how people um, uh, uh, um, the, the sort of material conditions of people's lives shapes but not determines um, uh, how they see the world, um, uh, but only in a mediated way, in quite a complicated way. Um, and I think that this is something that, um, if you read the prison notebooks, you see is, is always sort of threaded into his analysis of how... Um, uh, how he hegemony works. And one thing I, I just would like to say about um, uh, hegemony 
is that it is not just about narratives and ideas. Hegemony is about things like control of the schools, control of media, control of um, uh, where people can get jobs. It's, it's about those kind of real material realities that help to um, uh, shape, uh, shape lives. And on the question of uh, Trump, and uh, Trump's tweets and this. I think that Trump is a very good example of someone who has mastered this uh, common sense uh, narrative. Now, and I think one of the problems that those on the left face is that it's much easier to go with the prevailing hegemony. And basically this is what uh, Trump is doing. And so it's much harder if you're going against that grain and really trying uh, to fight it. But I think it is absolutely crucial <coughs> that um, there is a kind of uh, progressive common sense. And someone who comes to mind, I think, who is good at doing this is Michael Moore, who, who, who does this. The only thing I would add, and, and I'm intentionally a little bit provocative here, is I don't think Gramsci would allow the premise of your question. Culture is part of the material life. Just as the uh, concrete experiences on the job shape how you think, how you think shapes your concrete experiences on the job and what they mean to you. Literally, what the experience is, is shaped by your thinking. That's what used to be called, before it got devalued, a dialectically materialist perspective, that you understood that the harsh realities of job and, and survival literally shape your thinking, but the other way as well. It's a dialectic back and forth, so that culture is given the same importance in shaping what happens in our society as are those what used to be called the material realities of, of earning your living. On the point about uh, Trump, for me the best example was the way that he, and he's one of many who does this, takes the misery, cultural mental misery, imposed on the mass of the American working class, either by their unemployment or their work in a meaningless job, or a job that has only the technical function but never the design or mastery or direction of what's going on, and that's the vast majority, and very cleverly shifts it. It's not about the system. It's not even about your employer. It's about the bad government. You see, the bad government and the nasty Democrats who look upon all of you as miserable, smashed down people, why you might even call them all deplorables. Why not? He uses that very creatively to make masses of Americans very angry at politicians of both sides, but particularly the liberal ones who seem to care about making things better for poor people or immigrants, but leave the mass of those who are working and oppressed. On so they begin to feel that their enemy is what Trump wants their enemy to be. We have to be saying, no, no, that's a mistake. He's the one percent. Here is where you're misery. That's the argument. And then they begin to see and experience that very oppression and that exploitation. Yeah, I would only add that the, the, the liberal class, the liberal elites, hung in with a Democratic Party that completely turned on the working class. And this has created an existential crisis, uh, which Richard Rorty wrote about, actually, in his last book, Achieving Our Country. I, I watched it in Yugoslavia with a, with, a, with a feckless and ineffectual liberal elite. And what happens is that they turn, happened in Weimar as well, they turn on that liberal class, which has betrayed them. But what's dangerous is that they turn on the supposed values that that liberal elite said they propagated or propagate, but of course they don't. So, I mean, who suffered most as uh, a group following the 2008 crash? Well, we know. Statistically, it was African Americans. And, and the liberal elites will speak in that language of inclusivity and multiculturalism but they've upended it. I mean, what has feminism become? Feminism 
as it is for me defined by Andrea Dworkin, is about empowering oppressed women. But feminism in the hands of the neoliberals is about a woman CEO or a woman president or, as to quote Cornel West, a black president who serves as the black mascot for Wall Street. And this has created an opening for the proto-fascists because the liberal elites give credibility to their argument. And the argument is, you've been disempowered and disenfranchised at the expense of minorities and GBLT people, and, but it's not true. Statistically, it's not true. The liberal class has betrayed these people. I mean, for the bottom three quarters of African Americans in this country, life is worse than when King marched on Selma. But they peddle the fantasy, the myth, the lie of a post-racial society and, and opportunities, and this, this plays right into the hands of demagogues like Trump who can use it to say these people have been empowered at your expense. And that, that, that creates a very incendiary and very dangerous political climate that we are all in. I think we should probably draw to a close. I just want to draw people's attention. Maybe I've got one last question, but I do want to just draw people's attention to a workshop tomorrow at 10 that I'm going to be part of about building media and cultural heft that can tell the stories of some of these anti-hegemonic, particularly economic initiatives that um, we're seeing all around the country. How can we become greater than the sum of our parts? And I don't know what room we're in, but Gar Alperovitz is here, who will be part of it, I'll be part of it, and a bunch of people from the New Economy Coalition. Before we close, we must, I think, address war just for a moment. Because one of the points of the Gramsci story that's so important is the point at which liberal parties in Italy supported the invasion of, Lib of Libya and supported uh, the, w the, the war. Talk, if you can, about war in this context and the role that war and militarism plays in all of this. Because I think in all of the factors that we consider about our reality, somehow our ongoing series of wars um, doesn't come in for as much attention as it needs to. Well, that's a very important point. And Gramsci, like Rosa Luxemburg, understood that the socialist parties, by signing on for the war efforts, whether that was in Germany or whether that was in Italy, was disastrous. Um, and um, it essentially channeled the passions of the proletariat and the working class into the war effort. There's a quote by uh, Gramsci uh, where he says, he, he deals with exactly that point. He says, but it is not enough that a revolution be carried out by the proletarians for it to be a proletarian revolution. But is it enough for it to be a proletarian revolution? War, too, is made by proletarians. But it is not, for this reason alone, a proletarian event. For it to be so, other spiritual factors must be present. There must be more to the revolution than the question of power. There must be the question of morality of a way of life. Nationalism has, is, a, is a wonderful mechanism by which and it worked in the First World War uh, it, across the board, including in our own country, in diverting the left. And uh, we go back to the Cold War. I mean, this was part of the destruction of the left in that that element of the liberal class, the left had been decimated, let's say, but that element of the liberal class, Henry Wallace coming to mind, that was not pro-war, was destroyed. And the last vestige of that, a traditional liberal who opposed imperialism and the military evisceration of our country was George McGovern. And what happened to McGovern was that both sides, both Democratic and Republican elites, joined forces to destroy him. So I think that's an, a very important point, that though you cannot be a socialist unless you are an anti-imperialist. And uh, what is killing this country, the, the, the most dangerous institution to this country, is the military, which is now, it, it cannot be audited, it cannot be checked, uh, it, it, the entire society is being militarized, the forces of oppression that are used on the outer reaches of empire, drones, wholesale surveillance, militarized police that use lethal force against unarmed uh, uh, civilians, all of this is coming back, and this is how empires die. They are hollowed out from the inside by the 
but uh, their resources drained and squandered uh, th with 16 war years of war in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, and then the the harsher the brutal forms of control on the outer reaches of empire migrate back into the heart of empire, which is precisely the historical process that we are undergoing. It also can be seen the solidarity of the two major parties around capitalism being a wonderful thing. I don't know if you caught a few months ago, somebody asked uh, the, the speaker from California, uh, Ms. Pelosi, a question, a student, I believe, asked a question about capitalism. And you could see, if you saw the video, the befuddlement on her face. And she answers, but we're all pro-capitalist. The very question that there would be a question about it, she was unprepared for because it's off the radar. It, 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 well, the same thing goes with most of these military adventures. If I'm not mistaken, when, the, when Trump did that out of nowhere attack in Syria, a whole lot of Democrats said, well, that's the first good thing he did. Because they had to, including I believe Mrs. Clinton, they, they had good to adventure. do it. And the first thing, the first thing that Mr. Trump did where he didn't get too much flack was to give another $60 billion uh, to the military. Uh, it's one of the earliest acts of his thing. And again, for those of you who don't know, the United States already spends more on military than the next 10 countries combined. It's really important to understand that China and Russia don't come close to spending the kind of money that, that uh, we have, et cetera, even though they, they don't represent the kinds of threats that they ever did. So th this is, again, off the radar, can't be discussed. The military and the two parties are all of a piece, and we fight literally over the crumbs that are left because that issue, capitalism and, and war, are the you can't touch it kind. But that is also a weakness because that having been undiscussed becomes fertile ground for us to begin to say, hey, what about the link between those two? And who declared that those can't be questioned, those can't be attacked? And, and there's a population that doesn't know how to respond to what we might say any better than Mrs. Pelosi was able to respond to a question about capitalism. And then you have a global scenario of blaming the values of the invader who is pummeling your country. Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I don't have much to add, um, but um, uh, I, I would uh, just say that I think this whole kind of, I mean, the whole question of sort of on or off the radar. This is what Gramsci's notion of hegemony is really good at helping us to think about what is it. Because hegemony doesn't mean that you think uh, the everything's great. It means that you think there is no other way. There is no alternative. And that, ki that is incredibly powerful. And I think... Um, on the war, on the war question, uh, I would just—I mean, uh, Ernest Gellner, <laughs> who um, uh, was—I um, didn't always agree with, but he did in his little book on nationalism. He did have the wonderful example of this problem of the um, uh, postal misfunction of the angel of history. <laughs> how the angel of history was supposed to deliver. Uh, the revolutionary impulse to the working class, but unfortunately, by a dreadful oversight, it got delivered to the nation. And uh, the left has been trying ever since to get that message redirected. <laughs> All right, redirect everybody. Your work is clear. Um, thank you.